Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we've been looking at a series that I have tagged co heirs of a common destiny or not. We've had um, two, I think we've had two episodes in that um, in this series already in the broader context of our consideration of uh, marriage or the biblical blueprint for marriage in this general um, study that we have called male and female. Today, I want to add a little bit to the things that we have said previously with regards to uh, co as of a common destiny or not. And that's basically the inquiry about what happens to the uh, visions and to the purposes or to the failed uh, purpose of God for each of the persons that come together in a marriage uh, union. Do the destinies of each person, the man and the woman, do their destinies merge so that it becomes one? Uh, how do you go about that kind of a merger or what happens? We've, we've, we've had a bit of a study in that regard. Today, I want to read a verse of scripture from Song of Solomon. We did touch on Song of Solomon last Tuesday, I remember. Uh, today, I want to read a verse of scripture from Song of Solomon also, and it is in the fourth chapter of Song of Solomon, and it is in the fourth verse. So, Song of Solomon chapter 4 and verse 4. The Bible says, and I read, Thy neck is like the tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. I want to read that again. It says, Thy neck is like the tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. I want to uh, call your attention to the first phrase in that passage. It is the phrase, Thy neck. Thy neck. He's talking about your neck. Of course, you can imagine that this verse is a description, in part, it's, it's a description of the lady in, in, in the story, the principal lady in the story, and she's been described here. The description, according to this verse of scripture, of the lady, we've seen that lady described uh, previously in our last study as a garden enclosed, as a spring that is shut up, and as a fountain that is sealed. And we went on to look at the implications of the garden imagery that is used in describing this uh, lady. Today, we are looking at the imagery of the neck. The neck. So, she is said to be, uh, uh, the neck is said to be like the Tower of David. So, this is not like the lady is entirely compared to a neck, but she is said to have a neck and that that neck is like the tower of David, build it for an armory, whereon they hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Ladies and gentlemen, you, we are looking at uh, corporate destiny, issues of corporate destiny when a man and a woman come together. And we did say last Tuesday that when marriage happens, the garden goes from uh, my garden to his garden so that in a sense it basically becomes our garden. The man begins by saying a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. So the man calls her a garden that is enclosed. In verse 16, the lady says um, awake north, come, north wind, come thou south and blow upon my garden. All right, that the aroma thereof may flow out, let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. So the man begins by saying, a garden encloses my sister. The lady now comes on and says, uh, awake north wind, come thou south, blow upon my garden. She calls it my garden, but then says, let the aroma um, flow out, the smell, let the smell thereof, that's the aroma, flow out, and let my beloved come into his garden. Eventually, we saw the beloved saying, I am come into my garden. So we dealt with all of that uh, last Tuesday. 
Now, during that uh, study last week, we talked about what happens, what happens when two people get married. And in looking at the imagery of the garden, we said it, it goes through this transition so that in the end, you could literally call it our garden. But what comes out of that garden in the end is also like a combination of the things that were there before the man came and certain things that we didn't see uh, mentioned as being present before the man came. So he, 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 certain things are emphasized before the man came and they continued to be emphasized after the man came. There were certain things that were emphasized before the man came that were no longer emphasized after the man came. There were certain things that were completely not emphasized that were not available before the man came that came into the picture after that the man came. So we, we dealt with the dynamics and how that sort of a thing happens uh, in last Tuesday's episode. What I want to deal with uh, very briefly today uh, before the meeting continues is this imagery that we have before us in um, Song of Solomon chapter 4 and then in the fourth verse. So when the Bible says, thy neck is like the tower of David, but it is builded for an armory. Like this, this lady's neck says uh, uh, this passage is like the tower of David. The tower that the neck literally is 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 like a tower. But then this tower of David uh, as the neck is not naturally occurring. The Bible says, "Build it." Build it for an armory. That means that this, this neck has been intentionally actualized. It has been built. That's the point. Build it. And it was built with a purpose in mind. It is built for an armory. That means it is built as an armory. So you have a neck, but this neck is not just for wearing ornamental items like necklaces and, um, you know, brace, uh, uh, um, whatever, chains and that kind of stuff or beads around the neck. But that we have a lady here whose neck is like the Tower of David. If I had time, and I'm, and I'm sure I'll get back to this passage at some point in the future, if I had time, I'll talk to you about the, the, the possible implications or the, the critical implications of using the symbolism of the neck. You see, in scriptures, the, the neck is very symbolic. So when people become stubborn, the Bible would say that they have become stiff-necked. When Stephen is giving this uh, speech in Acts of the Apostles chapter 7, he charges the Israelite with stiff-neckedness and said, you are stiff-necked like your parents have been and you continue to resist the Holy Spirit. To, to be stiff-necked means to be stubborn. It, 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 it means to be obstinate. They, and the language is graphic. You see, your head turns on your neck right so to have a stiff neck means that you have a neck that forbids or that makes that complicates or that makes turning difficult so it is stiff it means that the you are not malleable you 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 cannot you know you cannot roll you cannot move your head around and that is because the neck itself is stiff so when that connection between the head and the neck is such that the neck has such a controlling power that uh, that minimizes or that uh, that defeats mobility and movement, you say it is a stiff neck. It is symbolic of stubbornness. That means that you cannot be led, you cannot be directed, you are, you, are, you are stiff, you are stubborn, you are obstinate. It means that you are set in your own way. The neck is also uh, symbolic in scripture for, sometimes of course it's used for the entire person. Uh, that popular passage in Isaiah chapter 10 that talks about uh, verse 27 where the Bible talks about the, um, the yoke being broken because of the anointing. It talks about the yoke that is placed upon the neck. The neck is a place where the yoke is placed. In Joshua and elsewhere in uh, uh, in the book of Judges, you see when people are 
conquered, sometimes they fall on their faces and their conquerors place their heads, their feet, I mean to say, on the necks of the enemy that they have conquered. The neck is a very, very powerful uh, organ and a very, very powerful symbolism in scripture. But briefly and graphically also, the neck is what connects the, the rest of the body with the head. So the neck is like that bridge that connects the head and the rest of the body. If, you're, if the neck is faulty, if the neck is bad, if the neck is stiff, if the neck is uh, infirmed, as it were, you are going to have a complete dysfunction on your hands because the body uh, relates with the head through the intricate network of nerves and of the cord and your spinal cord and all of that that goes through the neck and then connects with the head and the brain. The neck therefore becomes an important powerful metaphor and symbol for the role that a woman can play in the life of a man. Actually, once you have gone past the, the head as you are moving down the very next thing that you are coming in contact with is the neck is the neck i'm doing a bit of uh, a transfer of symbolism here and the bible says that the neck of the woman because literally her head in bible language would be the husband the husband is the head of the wife all right so her head would be the husband so it's almost more like the the most immediate representation of the woman in that sense would be the body of the man and the first point of call as you examine the body would be the neck so the the bible describes this neck as being like a tower is a simile that your neck is like the tower, but not just any ordinary tower. It's like the tower of David. Your neck is like the tower of David. But this tower of David has been built. It was built as an armory. I'm trying to say that there is, a, there is an orientation that uh, men and women need to assume in a married relationship. Last Tuesday, we said that whatever the man meets in the garden that he likes, he uses. Whatever he meets, meets in the garden that he does not like, uh, he negotiates um, how to work with it. And whatever he likes that he does not meet in the garden, he would either decide to forego it or he can labor to actualize it in that garden. So as to say that what eventually comes out as our lives or our life together in a married relationship is not going to be the result of this intentional interaction of purpose and vision and orientation and understanding of the will of God and how that is worked out in the practical context of the lives of the two people that are involved. So there's a sense in which there, will, there would be an evolution of some sort where the man needs to go for a while without what he would really have loved to have because it is not currently available in the garden and he needs to walk to plant, to till the earth, and then to plant the seed, and to water it, and eventually to see it grow, uh, to see it germinate and grow and become a powerful tree before he can begin to benefit from the fruit of that which he has planted. And that would take some time. So within that period, he's not going to have the services of this particular fruit or this particular tree, even though it is in view. So the, the 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 situation is such that the garden continues to evolve but it's evolving according to a, a very specific pattern or a very specific intent or design that has been mutually agreed upon and that has been mutually communicated the imagery today is something in pursuit of this same kind of picture it is that the, the, the woman is said to have a neck that is like the Tower of David and it is builded. That this is not a weak 
uh, neck. Th this neck is not a stiff neck yet. It is a tower neck. It's a tower neck. That this, this neck has such a functional purpose in the context of marriage that is just beyond the emotion, that is beyond the romance, that is beyond, you know, uh, 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 aesthetics. Okay? The neck does not just exist so that the husband can adorn it with beads and adorn it with very beautiful necklaces and adorn it with very, very exquisite chains as, it, uh, as the case may be. Now, none of those things is wrong so don't get me wrong none of those things is wrong but the point is that in focus before us is this story and this story is saying that this neck your neck is like the tower of david so I, I may want to ask, for instance, whether you are married or you are not married, whether you are male or you are female, particularly for those that are married, male or female. If you are male and you are married, the question would be to say, what kind of what kind of thing does the neck of your wife look like? All right. The reason why I'm asking, even if you are a married man, is because this neck does not occur naturally. It is built. It is built. So a man and a woman in a marriage relationship must take responsibility for the outcome, for the building of that neck. Nobody is born with a neck like this. This neck is not, is not a gift of the spirit. It is something that is built. So if you don't build it, you don't have it. If it hasn't been built, it does not exist. The fact that it does not exist does not mean it cannot exist. It just simply means it has not yet been built. That's why you don't yet have it. So, if you are a man, instead of complaining, like, she, she's not a burden bearer, right? Your wife cannot bear burden. And as spiritual people, as Christians, when we use that language, we know what we're talking about. It means that this person is probably not uh, carrying with you the burdens of your calling or the burden of destiny as much as you would expect them to bear the weight and so you, you you feel like you are carrying all of this load all by yourself that feeling is not wrong we're just simply saying that you can do something about it and if you are a lady um, I want you to know that marriage is not uh, is not an ornamental arrangement. It's not just something that God put in place for aesthetics. I'm just looking for. It's not an escape from work. It's not an escape from from labor. Marriage is ministry. Marriage is hard work. Uh, somebody had said that a long time ago. That marriage is hard work. And I believe it. Marriage is hard work. That when you come into a marriage, you need to be coming with a neck. A neck that is tough. A neck that is tough, not stiff. All right? There are different kinds of necks. In, 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 in the book of uh, Isaiah, the Bible talks about those that have literally like long neck. It talks about the daughters of Zion. And it wasn't a good description, by the way, that have outstretched neck. It's almost like... <laughs> A giraffe neck and giraffing in that context is like those that are not satisfied with their context that are always trying to poke nose to find out what is happening on the other side. It's the kind of thing that happens in an exam situation where everybody is taking care of their own uh, 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 um, exam question papers. And then there's somebody who is trying very hard to see what the other person is doing with their own allocation, that which has been allocated to them. They are not satisfied with what is before them. They are stretching to see what is before their neighbor. Maybe because they are trying to look for, oh, how beautiful is that going? Or how well is the person doing? Or how badly is the person doing? Or is there anything that I can import from that place? It is that state of affair where you are not completely content with what is given to you. Or at the very least, it is a form of negligence of that which belongs to you. So in scripture, that kind of neck is said in the book of Isaiah to be a neck that is outstretched or a stretched out neck. You in very uh, local parlance, we talk about long neck. To have a long neck or a, a, uh, or a giraffe neck is a neck, is a, is a posture where somebody is trying to interfere or to get involved in what is happening with another person that ordinarily should not be their business. And now this happens um, almost 
at the expense of what they are supposed to be paying attention to. I'm saying that you can be these kinds of necks, even though I'm not properly dealing with that today. But, but the neck before us is like a tower. All right? It's not like a stiff thing. It is not like a, a stretched out neck. This one is like a tower of David. Remember that David was a man of war. This is one of the greatest uh, and most, uh, uh, not just delicate, this is a profound, profound pronouncement to make. That they, they, they liken the neck of this woman to not just any tower, but the tower of David. This is like uh, part of the armory of David, that the arsenal, the military might of David is, is accommodated partly on these towers. And they said that the neck of this woman is like the tower of David that has been built as an armory. It has been built as an instrument of war. And lady, I'm talking to you. This is a description that is given to one of your uh, uh, one of your king's women, as it were. This is a description of a lady. This is a description of the daughter of Zion. That the daughter of Zion is supposed to be uh, such a, a personality that we can say her neck is like the Tower of David. It's built for an armory. You are you you are prepared for war. You are crafted to fight, and you are crafted not just to fight but to provide infrastructure to provide some kind of accommodation for military arsenals of uh, uh, of such a caliber that can be equated with the arsenals and the military uh, uh, proficiency and the equipment of King David, the most outstanding military figure in all of the history of the Jewish people till today. Thy neck. It's like the Tower of David. This Tower of David has been built. And it's been built as an armory. And so that I can close. The Bible says it's built for an armory whereon they hang a thousand bucklers. So on top of this neck, they are hanging bucklers. That's, that's like shields. Okay? Weapons of war. Have been have been dropped upon the neck, so it's like when you go to the storeroom, when you go to the uh, to, to the weapons room of David, the, the weapon space of David. Like we have a lot of these uh, 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 military cantonments where we have armories, uh, military armories. When you go into this armory, the Bible is saying that there is a tower, and that tower here is the neck of the woman. And that this, this woman's neck, like the Tower of David, has been built as an armory in itself. Whereon, that means on top of this neck, there hang a thousand bucklers. The buckler is an instrument of war. It's like the shield. And the Bible actually now says, these are all shields. They are shields of mighty men. Not vain men. Not mean men. Not mere men. These are mighty men. That the, 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 the weapons, the, the, the military equipment of mighty men are accommodated on the neck of a woman. Madam. Sister, the Bible is saying that you are supposed to be this kind of infrastructure that contributes to the realization of a military formation out of Zion that are called mighty men. There are ladies that are like the graveyards of mighty men. And there are ladies that are like the grooming grounds of mighty men. That your neck can accommodate. That a husband can have a wife upon whose neck the destinies of mighty men can be groomed, can be hanged. And those mighty men would not have been said to have made their water loo, but rather that you have become the, the accommodation, the edifice that, that takes them, that carries them. Shields of mighty men. 
Do you know that God intends that as a woman? Do you know that God intends that together with your husband that there, you are supposed to have carrying capacity that the destinies of mighty men can depend upon you, can be can be placed upon you and you will carry it gallantly and bring them into the fullness of the ordinations of God for each of their lives. Thy neck is like the tower of David, build it for an armory, whereon hang a thousand, a thousand, and that's symbolic for numerous, numerous. Imagine Madam Sarah, the, the wife of uh, Father Abraham, all right? And the Bible says that when Lot was in trouble, in Genesis chapter 14, um, uh, somebody came and told Abraham that Lot, his uh, nephew, had been taken away with Sodom and Gomorrah as Paul's. When Lot heard, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 14, that Lot armed his uh, servants that were, armed his trained servants that were born in his house, 318 young men. All right. So there were these 318 young men that were born in the house of Abraham and then they were trained by Abraham. And on this day of war, on this day of battle, these young men were the ones that Abraham put ammunition in their hands. And it was with those 318 young men that he goes to war to recapture a, a, a lot and turn and overturn the victory that had already been secured by the invading armies. And that day, the victory was now short-lived because Abraham came into the situation. My point is Sarah. My point is Sarah. Sarah did not go with them in that war. But you see, Sarah was a woman at home. At this point, Sarah had not even yet had a child of her own. Yet, 318 military men had been raised under Sarah. Because the Bible said they were born in the house of Abraham. And they had been trained by Abraham. What am I talking about? That your neck can be like the, the tower of David that has been built as an armory so that bucklers wear on hand. They hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Imagine how many times Sarah had uh, performed the role maybe of a midwife. Because these 318 young men were born in the house. These were the young men. We are not yet talking about the young ladies. We are not talking of those that are too young at this point, whether male or female, to be enlisted in war. And those that were still in training, we are not talking of those that were too grown or too old now to still be drafted into a military formation. When you have 318 choice young men that are battle ready in a community, you can imagine what the total population of that community will be. These were all people that were born in the house of Abraham while Abraham himself was still childless. So imagine in Nigerian palace, imagine the number of, uh, uh, um, what is it called now? Babysitting, imagine the number of omugos that Sarah had done while being burying herself. So she's taking care and helping uh, these servants uh, uh, as they are just literally just proliferating everywhere with children. It's just like they were on a birth giving spree. But the man and the woman under whose roof all of these were happening, themselves they were barren. But we are saying that Sarah was such an infrastructure that provided the support system for these warriors to emerge with which Abraham could go to war in order to uh, 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 defeat a conglomeration of, of nations that had gone out to war against Sodom and Gomorrah and the other confederate nations. Thy neck is like the tower of David. Build it. So when I come back later on, we're going to be looking at these issues of building. We're going to be looking at the issues of capacity. Capacity. Because do you know the kind of infrastructure you need to put a thousand bucklers, not a thousand necklaces? Even as a lady, do you know what burden it would be if you, if you stack 1,000 necklaces around your neck? 
but we are talking of a thousand shields shields not the ones that are for play they are not toys these are shields of mighty men mighty men it talks to you about capacity it talks to you about strength it talks to to to, to you about durability this neck is strong but this neck is not stiff because a stiff neck is a stubborn disposition is an obstinate disposition. So being strong and being stubborn are not the same things. But I'm already out of time, so I'm going to keep it at this point. So yes, we are looking at this issue of being co and how that works out uh, in reality. That the, 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 the impact that our lives are supposed to make as a couple, they don't need to be bifurcated right they don't they don't need to be bifurcated so it, it, it is your neck but it's like the tower of david yes but then it has been built okay it's been built for an armory whereon they hang a thousand bucklers all shields of mighty men no wonder the imagery of david is also used there david was a man of was a man of war david was not solomon and i'm saying to you that marriage is ministry marriage is military Marriage is ministry. Marriage is military. It doesn't matter if you are getting married to a pastor or you are not getting married to a pastor. If you are a believer, you must approach marriage from these standpoints. That marriage is ministry. Marriage is also military. It's military. That the destinies of young men and young women should be safe in your hands, O oh woman. That people don't come into your space as a married woman and then they lose appetite for divine things and for spiritual things. That people's destinies are not aborted or miscarried because they were entrusted into your care. Thy neck is like the Tower of David. This is one of the greatest compliments that I believe that scriptures can pay to the strength and the anticipated uh, capacity of a woman in a marriage context. And as we go on in the series, we are going to continue to just oppose these scriptures to see where the man comes in, where the woman comes in, where the society or the ecclesia comes in as we consider issues of joint heirs in the context of marriage.